I want to be sure to invite you to our upcoming Prophecy Conference. It's going to be in wonderful, beautiful Colorado Springs this August 6th and 7th and 8th. Boy, I tell you, August here where I live is a hot month, and Colorado Springs is a great, cool place. We're going to be in a lovely hotel, uh, the Marriott there on uh, Tech Center Drive. We're going to have an incredible lineup of speakers. Many of them helped us in Florida. Uh, some of the headliners are going to be Bob Cornuke, Jerome Corsi, Pastor Billy Crone, Pastor Russ Dizdar, Joseph Farah, uh, very well-known, recognizable names. We would love for you to join us. The registration cost is only $90 for the conference. What a deal. Three days of solid biblical prophetic teaching uh, and a chance together with believers from all over. You need to call us and register for this, and we would love to have you do that. The number is 800-475-1111 or prophecyofthenews.com on our website. Thank you. Hello, and welcome to Prophecy in the News. I'm your host, Kevin Clarkson. I have a fascinating guest today who has created a feature film that is uh, really making a lot of splash around Christian community. It's in 48 countries. It's called Let the Lion Roar and really is the culmination of, of uh, years and decades of fruition in the life of our guest, Derek Frank. Hello, Derek. Kevin, it's good to be with you, to really be here on Prophecy in the News. It's uh, <laughs> great to have this time with you. Well, it's nice to welcome you, and we're going to plumb some depths, but maybe by way of introduction, I might uh, tell our viewers that you've been a pastor for 28 years prior to your life in production and a businessman, <laughs> and you also... Um, pastored most of the time in Europe, is that right? That's right, a fair bit of the time, yes, latterly in the old city of Geneva. I was, I was uh, ministering in a church just a few hundred yards where Calvin preached the Reformation, and it was an incredible privilege to be able to have that season there. With uh, We had about 30 different nationalities in the church, so very stimulating. Everyone believed their own denominational view was the right one, so it was a very interesting All challenge right. to <laughs> find our way through that very eclectic congregation. So the religious wars are still happening in <laughs> Europe. <laughs> The 30-year war. <laughs> yeah. You, you pastored as well in Britain, which is yes. your homeland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm English. My wife is French. And so that's where I started after I came out of business. And then really the Lord had placed a call on my heart from many years earlier to I felt one day he would have me pastoring in Geneva. It was just one of those God stories. He wasn't a straight line. It really is with God. But that's where he took us to because there was a real purpose of being there in the old city of Geneva that we might really sense a particular message that God wanted us to share. Well, you were telling me that your wife uh, had a dramatic uh, coming to Christ as a teen in uh, France. That's right, yeah. Yeah, um, like many of us in ministry, um, you know, the, the classic statement, I'm, I really am the head of our family, but of course it's the neck which turns the head. Yes. And we so uh, depend upon our spouses in ministry, and I owe so much to her for what she's enabled. But she was really converted. Uh, she grew up very near to Geneva, and she had an amazing conversion experience uh, out of a very sort of godless background. And what was so extraordinary as she as a late teenager was converted was the moment she, she was shown the Bible, which she'd never, ever read before. Um, she, she questioned the American missionary she was with and saying, but I'm not sure I should be reading this. I'm a Gentile, and this is a Jewish book. And she knew straight away that this, this script she, she was re reading was written uh, by Jewish people immediate, in a Jewish way. Immediate and she recognition. knew that at wow. conversion. This was absolutely a gift of the Spirit, and it's been part of the equipping of me for the journey that's gone on since then. That's a good link. Um, because really your product, your movie, and uh, the accompanying book, and the name of the, the film is Let the Lion Roar. That is right. Let me tell you a little bit about Let the Lion Roar, of course, the lion being the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is, if you were to describe it in a few phrases, it's, it's a very high-impact docudrama. It's groundbreaking in, in Christian film terms. It's the first one that's been ever done in a way which combines both drama and documentary. And the goal of it is to take believers right back to the very beginnings of the Christian era. Now we do this using Hollywood actors, so we've got Kevin Sorbo from God's Not Dead and Stephen Bolden, we've got messianic leaders like Sid Roth and Jonathan Bernis and Chuck Pierce and quite a few others. We use a lot of special effects, but the point of all this is to help believers understand where the church came from right back at its start and to understand that really in what as we see it looking back was almost the start. It wasn't quite the start 
going forward, but looking back as to how the church got disconnected from the Jewish roots of its faith. How this, as this disconnection happened, what it did to the church, how that affected it in the early centuries so that by around the fourth century, many of the famous church fathers had become quite anti-Semitic. How this led to the church losing its handle really on the gospel, how this led into the dark ages where for maybe a thousand years people had no direct access to scripture. Even at the reformation when the gospel is recovered that we are saved by grace through faith, there's no understanding of the context of the gospel being God's continuing plan for Israel and how that shaped the birth of the Protestant church and then how that leads down to church as it is today and even more crucially, what it may mean for the church in the coming times. We don't know how near they are. But all this in a one-hour docudrama. And with this, we give a book as well called Escaping the Great Deception. So it's quite a paradigm shift. But believers don't need to know any church history. They don't have to read theology. They only need to know where the on button is. Oh, okay. And that's all they need to know. And simple. this will then hopefully explain so much maybe help them rethink their understanding of what the gospel really is and what it means for them to walk on with God in his purposes in these incredible times we actually find ourselves living in. And I want to say, of course, this is prophecy in the news. <laughs> we are in the end times. And, uh, you know, we saw Israel dispersed uh, in 70 AD, uh, destroyed, and then another destruction in 135. And they were dispersed to the nations of the world. And we've been through really 20 long centuries. And so often in, in the way God has done things in his book and in history, uh, I've seen Derek almost um, a symmetric mirror image, if you will, where things kind of echo here and then meet in the middle at the heart. Mm. And if you, if you look at history like that, it seems like we're seeing Israel, you know, restored to the land in 1948. Uh, geopolitical events today are fastly approaching a boiling point and we believe the return of the Lord is imminent and it's so timely that you would bring this forth. I think this is the thing that I would love to say Kevin well this is all a strategic plan that I worked out right from the start and it wasn't like that at all it's one of those callings that God takes you on a journey but let me just share a little bit of how it did happen to me because as you said I've been pastoring for 28 years and I've seen church in very different situations in very desolate areas where you wonder how God would ever break in and very mm. affluent situations I've seen very small church and very large church I've seen uh, local parish church I've seen international church I've seen a wide, wide spread. I've seen, I've started as an Anglican clergyman. I've been a Baptist pastor. I've related to people from so many denominations. So I've had a very wide experience of church. And here was my question. After all this, I've seen God move. I've seen people being converted. We've seen healings. We've seen lives being restored. We've seen mission outreaches. We've seen so much happen. But I would still have to say I was left with this question. Why is it the church sort of happens. It doesn't not happen because it certainly does, but are we really the salt of the earth? Are we really the light of the world? How is it that the world is better at changing the church than the church changing the world? I mean, mm. we're meant to have rivers of living water flowing out, mm -hmm. and actually it seems it's the dirty water of the world flowing in. No, oh, And I'm left wondering, what's missing? I mean, is it that the gospel isn't what Jesus, what Yeshua said? Well, I actually think it probably is. Maybe just we just haven't got quite the right program. If only you had the right music or a better building or some outreach program or, you know, maybe if we just moved to the church, a better location or, you know, but some guy would have cracked it by now if that was the answer. I mean, the, the implication is there is something missing that we've actually not got hold of as we should. And the day came when God said to me, Derek, you can either go on preaching a thousand messages to the same few hundred people, or you can share one message with hundreds of thousands of people. Now, I had no idea idea of the journey God was going to take me on, uh, let alone that I should be here on Prophecy in the News with you. But this is part of the journey that God took me to share one message. And that one message is about the continuing place of Israel in God's purposes. That unless the gospel is contextualized in that, we haven't properly understood what the gospel is actually 
all about. And that was the message that I knew God was saying I had to set off and to share. I had not, I have to say, for one minute imagined the story if I'd understood even mm. 5%. I'm not sure we'd have set off, but that's the way God works. Like with Abraham and Sarah, he says, will you set off? And you set off and you let go of things. Isn't and that the way it, it that's is? That's the way it is. <laughs> with <laughs> the Lord. stream you discover more and more, and I'm still wondering how much else God wants us to discover. But it was this, this deep, deep, passion to help people understand the significance of Israel and God's purposes. And it really came from a story which happened to me years and years earlier through a vision God had given me, maybe 25 years back. And this was in the days of the Signs and Wonders ministry, and John Wimber had led many of us into our at this time a young pastor in a large charismatic church and actually visions back then I think in some senses were more prominent than they are now maybe low-level visions but mm -hmm. people kept getting pictures from from God and I kept getting one very particular one which was of like a Greek front of a building of pillars in front of a big courtyard and I sort of sensed it was a church couldn't prove it but sort of sensed it was a church and then the vision would move inside and I'd see people with headphones on it was a modern day conference and people from many nationalities and the same end words every time with the vision complete the reformation deep voice complete the reformation hmm. now this happened not once it happened I don't know how many times and I tried getting interpretations. I asked people who are supposedly very good at interpreting visions, and people would have visions like, well, God says you're a rose. That means you've got a lovely scent. You look beautiful, but maybe there's a few thorns on your side that you should have cut off or something <laughs> like that. I mean, we had visions like that. When you go around saying, God said to me, complete the Reformation, people say, who is this guy? I was a young pastor. I had visions for ministry, but even I felt it was a bit above my pay grade to complete uh -huh. the Reformation. And actually, it became very very uncomfortable and I had to say to God either give me the interpretation of this or stop doing because I'm going to blow up and it stopped but I couldn't get rid of it I it, this thing went with me everywhere I mean I could never forget this vision and fast forward a few years we were walking through Francois and I through the old city of Geneva one day and I had no idea we'd end up pastoring actually in Geneva actually only meters from where I saw the fulfillment of the vision and there I saw the very building that I had seen in my vision the church building absolutely if I could have drawn it it was razor sharp mm. there it was now if you had an experience of seeing in the flesh what you've seen in the spirit before I mean other people have this you <laughs> I mean, whoa, like, oh. And then I realized it was the cathedral, it's called the Cathedral of Saint-Pierre, which is where John Calvin had preached the Reformation from. Mm. And I knew in that minute that God had a prophetic assignment for me. I had no idea what it was going to be. I didn't know what to do. It. But Francois told me, that, and I'm just quivering all over. I don't know what to do with myself. I mean, I just, I actually understood what Moses felt like a little bit when Moses in front of his son in front of the burning bush. You know this is God. But even then he said, actually, I don't think I'm quite the man for the job. I, actually, I'm not very good at talking. Maybe I'm not quite the man. And you know God's got you and you're making excuses and you know how silly your excuses are yes. because he's saying, I've chosen you, I've called yes. you. I have a prophetic purpose for you. Go find out what it is. And that's really where it all began for me in the journey forward to discover what it meant to complete the Reformation. Now, I had no idea at that stage how completing the Reformation had to do with God's purposes for Israel. That, that was another journey. That's amazing, um, especially that you saw the actual church <laughs> years before, yeah, yeah. multiple times uh, in these visions. But your heart must have quickened. And Derek, what did you what did you do and, and how much time, if I can ask, was between seeing it in Geneva and actually going to pastor later in Geneva? Well, there were quite a few years time gap and what we try and show in the film, Let the Lion Roar, which we sort of condense, we do a little bit at the start, mm -hmm. to actually show this vision and actually try and model it so people can imagine me trying to travel this, this journey. So this is the power of film. You can condense years into a few frames in a film. But we try and, and use, by using different actors and so on in Let the Lion Roar, this picturing of how I then try and grapple with whatever was the Reformation 
is about. Now, you yourself have read the Reformation. You know how mm-hmm. thick the books are, oh, how indeed. heavy they are. You read through. It is enormous what went on. And I did not know what I was looking for until one day I discovered one tiny little snippet of church history, a rarely known story, and it took the lid off the whole thing for really? me. Really? What had happened prior to the 16th century Reformation, Europe was incredibly anti-Semitic. And the Jewish people were a cursed people. They, they were already suffering terribly. Now, in the year 1492, which is about 50 years before John Calvin ever got to Geneva and turned the city round into the mm-hmm. sort of city of God through the Reformation, the Jewish people had been evicted from the city of Geneva. And they were allowed to come mm. in during the day. They, if a woman was pregnant, a Jewish woman was pregnant, she'd have to pay a double toll. They, but they could for go the in two. during the day yeah, for the one inside. Um, but they had to be out before nightfall. Now, here's what went on at the Reformation. Geneva became a city of refuge for Protestants who had been in one way or another evicted from where they were because of the Reformation, went to Geneva. And this is what Geneva became so special. John Knox, the reformer, went Mm -hmm. to Geneva and he said that in one generation, the city had been turned around from the stinkiest city in Europe where new dancing was the big thing into the best example of the kingdom of God since the time of the apostles. It was dramatic. And it modeled how through lives being transformed that society got transformed. It became like a blueprint, not just for how to run a city, but even to how, how to run a nation based on God's principles. It was that dramatic. And so Geneva doubles in size. It becomes the focal point for how the understanding of God's work can change society. But guess what? Who's not allowed there? The Jews. The Jews. They are still kept evicted. So subliminally, the message which goes out from Geneva and which indeed shapes the Protestant Reformation is this. The Jews are still a cursed people. Whatever else the Reformation is changing, there's one thing that's not changing. It is the Jewish people. They, they're to blame mm-hmm. for the death of the Savior. So they're a cursed people. I mean, (laughs) they always will be. This was wrapped into the DNA of the gospel which went out. Now, so much is happening in terms of lives being transformed. No one really notices. This is quite there. But as I began to see it, I thought, but that just does not fit with God's promises to Israel. I mean, he promised them an everlasting covenant. He said, I love you with an everlasting love. He says, look, Even if you could count until you can count all the stars in the sky, or you can understand everything under the earth, only when you can do all that will I cease to love Israel despite, notice these words, despite what they do, unconditional. So does that mean God's reneged on what he said? Romans 11.1, Paul says, um, has God given up on Israel? No way. Uh, End of Romans 11, God's promises, God's calling are irrevocable. That doesn't fit. Then I think, well, hold on a bit. If God's given up on Israel, um, boy, shouldn't he have given up on me or on others? I mean, we, we sin terribly. We, we depend on an unconditional covenant. Amen. This doesn't fit. And then, just a minute, but when the Jewish Messiah comes to his Jewish people, their whole understanding of what he's doing is to enable the kingdom to be restored through Israel. They only have what we would now call the Old Testament. They just have the Jewish scriptures. And for them, it is all about God fulfilling his covenant purposes through Israel. And these were the ones who turned the world upside down. Uh, The disciples, they were all Jewish. If they'd not done what they'd done, the first beliefs, we would not be here today. Now, it's strong, strong language to say that reformers like Calvin and Luther were not right. But it's even stronger language to say that God has reneged on his purposes for Israel. And this was really the journey that I then started traveling to understand what's now called replacement theology, how that actually shaped the history of the church through the centuries and what it did that brings it down to today and explains much of the reasons why today's church sort of works. And even more crucially, my great concern is to say, look, I think we're heading into deep waters in the times ahead. And if the church is not well founded on the truth and the great shaking happens, how will the church stand? How will individual believers stand? And this is really the message which led to the film, Let the Lion Roar, because the lion of the tribe of Judah wants to roar through his people in this day and age. And many believers know the Lord as the Lamb of God, 
Mm -hmm. They don't know him as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And this is a message which just has to roar in the times that we are in today. Well, Derek, I'd like to tell our <laughs> viewers, our guest is Derek Frank, uh, really the writer, creator, um, involved in the production of the movie Let the Lion Roar. We have a beautiful box set of this information. I'll just give heads off to you guys for the way you put this together. It includes um, a Blu-ray edition of a 60-minute docudrama uh, DVD. It also has a book. And the title is, of the book is Escaping the Great Deception. And uh, this is available to you for $29.95 plus shipping and handling. You can call the number on the screen or go to our website, prophecyinthenews.com, and get your copy. I just want to comment that um, you have accompanied the book, but it's not a heavy, deep theological read. It's, it's rather concise and uh, to the point, but it does have great content. And really, Kevin, in this, our goal was to put a book that does more than a film because it's amazing, even in a one-hour docudrama with all the equipping of film and all the technology, how little ground you actually cover in what is a big area. So this is why we put the book with it, that can and it picks up on the message of the film but takes you further into the message and provides a lot of backup scriptures. And ultimately, we're wanting people to read scripture with eyes wide open to mm -hmm. what the Spirit really wants to say about God's continuing purposes for Israel. And the message God really gave us in doing this is that he didn't want us just to release a movie, but a movement. And that really what he, God was saying is this is something you need to equip everyday believers with. So it's a DVD, people are used to watching film. It's a book which is as brief as we could make it, as succinct as we could to help people get into its message as easily as possible. That it would be in a package that you could share with confidence with other people that this is something you could give as a gift. This isn't just a message for you. It's a message to share with others so that a movement can affect mm -hmm. the church through its grassroots. And actually, you can get it downloaded as well. As we said, we're already out in 48 countries. Absolutely amazing how God is already sharing this. But he needs every single believer. Now, if I can just say to you, those w watching uh, this at this time, I don't want to say to you that I think God is probably speaking even to you right now, not just about getting hold of this message, but how the Lord wants to roar through you. I mean, Proverbs 28 says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. And he wants you to be equipped Amen. with the boldness and the message to share this with the unique circle of people that literally only you know. You have a unique circle of people that only you know, and each of them have a unique circle. You have actually your own mission field. And this is such a crucial message. And God is probably speaking to you if you're feeling that shaking of the spirit, touching you that witness at the moment. He's probably saying this is something that you have to get hold of in the time that we still have when we can speak freely, that not only do you have your eyes open to this message and your ears open, but also that others do as well. So I can only encourage you, get hold of it. Let it touch your spirit through the Holy Spirit's conviction. And then please, please, please share it boldly with others. Well, you said to me, as you pastored 28 years uh, and God planted this in your heart, I believe that this was going to be more than just giving hundreds of messages to uh, some people in a church, but that rather you would give one message to hundreds of thousands of people through the kingdom. And this is what film enables us, us to do and the opportunity of media, because I'd want to take, really, if I was going to bring viewers down to one particular message, the question is, what actually did happen at the start? And I don't want to simply say, look, when the devil saw that the Jewish Messiah has come, he's not only died, he's risen. There's no turning this around. Mm -hmm. Even more Jewish people who only had God on the outside, they've now got him on the inside. They were meant to be God's light to the world. They were not doing very well. But the one who is the light of the world has come. He's now in them. They're now becoming the light of the world. He can do nothing to turn this around. All he can do is confuse. The devil can only ever destroy. He can't create, but he can confuse. So he sows this lie and he says, did God really say, you know, you, you know the classic, did God really say mm -hmm. that God still has a purpose for Israel? And of course, in the short term, all the believers shout back, yes, because the reason is they're all Jewish. Right. But in a little <laughs> while, there's Gentiles coming in and they start to hear this message. Now, Satan's style is always to, I want to raise myself up, Isaiah 14. And Gentiles start saying, hey, this is about raising the church up. We're the new and improved Israel. 
and they buy the lie. Now, you know with the devil, his sale line is always buy one, get one free. So you buy one okay. lie, you get another lie. So they start to buy the lie that the church has replaced Israel because God's finished with Israel. And this opens the door to all sorts of other deceptions as they tracks down to this day. So, for example, if... God has finished with Israel, then the church is replaced with Israel. That means that grace has completely replaced law. And as it comes down to us today, that means grace as anything goes. And we're into compromise that covers the church that society then becomes open to. All from this one lie right back there. There's a great deception at the very root of the church where it lost its sense of identity, knowing truly who it is, that it's lost its understanding of its rootedness in the Jewish roots of the faith. Mm. It lost its understanding of its destiny and its testimony all through this one deception. Now, once you understand this one lie, you then understand what explains so much of church history and what explains so much of why the church is vulnerable today and so the big question really is, are people still taken in by the lie of replacement theology? And many people are without them realizing. Or are they actually following the lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who has chosen this nation of Israel to reveal his saving purposes through, of which we are then grafted into? I believe you're passionate about this, Derek. <laughs> and I can't wait uh, to have another show to explore really in depth these ideas we've only started to explain uh, what they're about and the product and the fact of the matter is succinctly replacement theology has done great damage not only to the church and the ministry of Jesus but to the Jewish people who are forever bearing that witness to the world absolutely. in the plan of God absolutely and as our time winds down here I want to just say again this uh, is an incredible message it surely reinforces, undergirds, strengthens what we here at Prophecy in the News have believed for years because it's in the Bible in Romans 9, 10, and 11. God is not done with Israel. God has a tremendous plan. He has allowed blindness in part until the fullness of the Gentiles. And we'll talk about that in a future show. But the Lord is doing this simply to stir his people up to jealousy. And so all Israel will be saved, as the scriptures say to us in Romans 11 and we look forward to that on that note we do want to say uh, the Reformation recovered part of the truth not all of the truth and that's created a distortion and that's what Derek's going to be speaking to in another program part of the truth they did recover is we are saved justified by faith in Christ and that's good to know it's not our works it's not our religious rituals it's not our performances it's coming to the Messiah Jesus seeing that he died on the cross for each of us and repenting of our sin and putting our faith in him. After he died and was buried, he rose again and he's returning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we invite you to call on him, trust in him that you too may be saved. But there's so much more God has for his people and it also involves Israel. Till then, we keep looking up. 